Two of the main research foci of our long-term study at Lomas Barbadal have been life history strategies and learning strategies. You will hear about some of our research on learning strategies in a talk co-authored with Brendan Barrett, also in this session. In this talk, I present some information that is at the intersection of these two lines of research. Here I talk about those aspects of Capuchin demography that are relevant to major research questions in biological anthropology and behavioral ecology more generally, about the relationship between life history and learning strategies. These set the stage for our ongoing research, which is currently in the data collection stage on the role of alloparenting in Capuchin skill acquisition and the possibility that grandparents play an important role in transmitting specialized knowledge to immatures. Many evolutionary anthropologists have proposed hypotheses linking aspects of life history, cooperative breeding, and learning strategies. This slide mentions a few of them. Several papers have been written suggesting a relationship between length of the juvenile period and relative brain size. For example, the needing to learn hypothesis proposes that complex, unpredictable niches select both for longer juvenile periods and larger brains, because both traits enable the time and ability to learn fitness relevant skills. The difficult diet hypothesis emphasizes that species having more difficult foraging challenges, so for example, extractive foragers, will be under selection for longer juvenile periods. Empirical tests of this hypothesis have produced mixed results, and some researchers suggest that the relationship between skill acquisition and age of first reproduction should exist only for the most challenging foraging skills. Sarah Hurdy and colleagues have emphasized the probable role of alloparenting in promoting high fidelity social learning, including pedagogy, which are critical for cumulative cultural evolution. The idea is that the more critical alloparents are for rearing young, the more selection pressure there will be on immatures to ingratiate themselves with alloparents to get their attention. Parents and alloparents are expected to be contingent caretakers, vigilant for cues of infant neediness, future reproductive value, and level of social support from alternative caretakers. Immatures, in turn, are selected to understand the moods and motivations of potential caretakers and to communicate with them in ways that align their emotional states and establish joint attention. So do grandparents play a special role in the survivorship and education of grandchildren? Kristen Hawks and colleagues have emphasized the probable role of grandparents and postmenopausal grandmothers in particular in promoting the survivorship of grand offspring in humans. Similar arguments have been made for elephants who have similar life histories to humans. It has been argued that the value of grandparents may not be exclusively in their value as food providers, but perhaps also in their role as repositories of cultural knowledge. The goals of this talk are to examine where capuchins stand with regard to critical variables in these hypotheses and what they potentially can tell us about the coevolution of life history, cooperative breeding, and learning strategies, particularly with regard to the role of grandparents. Capuchins have long lifespans, up to 55 years in captivity and 30 some years in the wild. The juvenile phase is long, with females reaching reproductive maturity around age six years and males around 10 years. Capuchins are highly reliant on extractive foraging. Nine of the 14 fruits that are dietary staples require at least one step to process and several require multiple steps. Most of the insects they eat also need to be extracted from woody matrices. Although capuchins are not obligate cooperative breeders, they do exhibit extensive alloparenting by both sexes in the form of carrying infants. And females are willing to nurse any other female's infant to the point that even infants orphan orphaned at a really early age can survive on these milk handouts. Alloparents are potentially valuable sources of information as they permit infants to observe their foraging techniques and social interactions at very close range and also permit scrounging. Our project has written several papers demonstrating an impact of social learning on foraging techniques, some of which will be summarized in Brendan's talk in this session. Note that capuchins represent a particularly interesting comparative data point for evaluating the hypotheses outlined in the earlier slides. In other words, for examining the cohesiveness of the adaptive package of long juvenile periods, large brain size, and alloparenting, especially by grandmothers, which is hypothesized to set the stage for complex cumulative culture in humans. Capuchins have evolutionarily converged with humans with respect to all of these traits, though they do not have these traits in such an extreme form as humans do. In this slide, you see the percentage of two-year-olds who are co-residing with each type of grandparent. This is a sample of 202 two-year-olds for which we have both patrilineal and matrilineal kinship information. You can see that nearly half of all two-year-old capuchins co-reside with maternal grandmothers and 15% co-reside with paternal grandfathers. Co-residence with grandparents on the paternal side is less common, but it does happen. And sometimes young capuchins even co-reside with great-great-grandparents 
So demographically, it does seem possible that grandparents might be important sources of socially transmitted knowledge. We don't know yet whether there are survival advantages to co-residing with particular types of grandparents, but here is a really preliminary analysis. In looking at a sample of 258 two-year-old Capuchins and comparing those who do reside, co-reside with maternal grandmothers to those who do not, it seems that those who are not co-resident with a maternal grandmother may be almost twice as likely to die in the following year of life. Looking at subsequent years of life is complicated by the fact that males disperse, making it hard to distinguish between death and dispersal. Anecdotally, we have sometimes seen Capuchin grandmothers adopt infants, both when their mothers have died and also as in this picture where their mothers have continued living and producing subsequent offspring. It's not clear whether grand maternal presence is generally beneficial, however. So do immature Capuchins actually visually attend more to the foraging efforts of their ancestors? These data on close range observations like this of foraging are from Rambo's group from a sample of 10 infants, five male, five female, that were intensively observed during the latter half of their first year of life. So this graph is set up so that it's a percentile ranking of zero to one with one being the, their top choice of monkey to look at in these interactions. Uh, red is opposite sexed and blue is same sexed and you have the kin and uh, well, the different categories of monkeys they could look at over here. So usually same sex peers or older juveniles of the same sex occupied the top few positions in terms of preference for peering. Grandparents and great grandparents labeled in red were not the top choice foraging demonstrator for any of these subjects. And even the mother ranked in the very top position for only one monkey were tied for, for first. Ancestors via the maternal line were preferred over ancestors through an uh, ancestor be the maternal line were preferred over ancestors through the paternal line, which is not too surprising. And father's mother and father's father were never recipients of peering, though these types are rare. Grandparents were almost always ranked in the bottom half of foraging demonstrators, despite a general tendency for monkeys to direct attention towards older monkeys, which seems to imply that grandparents are not considered by young monkeys to be repositories of particularly useful foraging knowledge. Whether young monkeys are correct in this assumption and whether this tendency changes as immature monkeys become older and wiser themselves will be the subject of future research. Independent of the issue of ancestry, do younger monkeys preferentially seek information from older, wiser monkeys? This graph is based on a much larger data set of a slightly different type from the previous graph. So whenever a monkey approached the focal monkey to within five body lengths and began to forage, we recorded whether the focal monkey paid attention to the foraging act or ignored it. So what this graph shows is the age-related changes in visual attention paid to others' foraging efforts. So the answer depends both on the age of the focal animal, which is on the x-axis, and on the ages of the foraging individuals, which are portrayed via these different um, modeling predictions for foragers at different ages. So you can see here that while younger monkeys look more in gener general to foragers, they look especially more often to the older monkeys, such as this line representing 20-year-old foragers, as opposed to this line representing one-year-old foragers. These graphs show the amount of time that male infants in the left-hand graph and female infants in the right-hand graph spend riding around on the backs of their mothers, the blue lines, male alloparents represented by the red dotted lines, and female alloparents represented by the yellow lines. Although male and female infants spend approximately equivalent amounts of time writing on their mothers as they develop. And also in the total amount of alloparental care received, there are striking differences in who provides the alloparental care received by male versus female infants. Male alloparents are almost exclusively interested in caring for male infants. However, female alloparents care for both sexes, though female infants are carried more by female alloparents than males are. The most critical time period where these sex differences are most extreme is in this period around five to eight months, which is when the infant is coming off the mother's back and starting to explore. And that's when alloparents are most eager to carry the infants. Okay, so we know they spend more time with same-sexed alloparents, but do they also bias their peering towards same-sex members? Yes, apparently they do. So 78% of females peering acts are directed at same-sexed individuals and 68% of males peering acts are directed to same-sex individuals. 
Fathers and grandfathers may exert subtle influence on the learning environments of their descendants that are not immediately apparent from rates at which they are directly observed by youngsters. One interesting feature of the Capuchin social life is the possibility that alpha males will retain their rank for long periods of time, up to 18 years or three generations. When they do so, this has a cascade of other effects that have the implications for the survival, reproduction, and learning environments of the other members of their group. This is because infanticide is the most frequent cause of infant mortality in this population. When alpha males stay in place, accumulating male descendants who help them defend the group from would-be infanticidal immigrant males, this can lead to demographic stability and growth. In this graph on the left, you see that five-year-old Capuchins who are co-resident with fathers or grandfathers, represented by the blue bars, tend to live in larger groups, see the x-axis, than those who do not co-reside with their fathers or grandfathers, that is the yellow bars. Monkeys living in larger groups have a wider choice of models to learn from, which could be an advantage in terms of accumulating valuable knowledge, for example, about what to eat and how to process it. Technical innovation rates were positively associated with group size in a comparative study of primate species, and larger groups are better at retaining innovations in their repertoires. Studies of navigation in birds have found that decisions based on pooling of information from more individuals are more likely to be accurate. And a theoretical model indicates that poorly informed individuals can obtain correct answers more often in larger groups when relying on social information. Members of larger groups can more cheaply gather personal information without impairing their ability to make accurate decisions. In this slide, you see a similar effect of co-residents with fathers or grandfathers on the number of immatures in the group. Different types of group members provide different benefits. Although the oldest group members probably have the most knowledge, it's often the case that techniques that work for an older monkey don't work for a smaller monkey who's weaker and less dexterous. Therefore, it's perhaps advantageous for immatures to also have role models who are only a little older than they are for learning certain types of things. And this may be why we saw peers were such popular targets for peering in previous slides. For learning social skills and developing important relationships with future allies, it can be tremendously advantageous to live in a group that has monkeys who are close in age with whom they can play and practice social skills. There are so many people to thank in the study of this link that I can't say thank you to everyone by name, but a special thanks to the 152 field assistants whose names you're going to see in other slides and other presentations in this session. And a very special thanks to our two long-term managers, Deepka and Hannah. Irene, Laura, and Linda were responsible for the genetic work that forms the basis of our kinship analyses, and Don Cohen helps us with our database. The Costa Rican Park Service and private ranches such as Hacienda Palón and Brindamore gave us permission to work on their land, and we're thankful for the many different funding sources listed below. <laughs>